next time. All right, uh, so quick announcements today. Quiz two is this week. What is that? There are these equations of lines and planes, most specifically, uh, very specifically there. Look at the homework that you handed in. Solutions are posted. Uh, they say, um, particularly the problem says, they find me the parametric form of a line that is blah, right? Where a blah could be through this point, right, and perpendicular to this line or, or, um, or in this plane, et cetera, those kind of things. Or it can be the equation of a plane right, that's perpendicular to a line through a perpendicular point. So get you, right, be ready to, for questions like, um, uh, like that. Uh, homework three is up. The process repeats next week. Nothing, right, um, nothing new. Uh, I'll likely be having extra office hours tomorrow for the second uh, section, because they're missing it, but I'll put you on the announcement. You're welcome to come as well. All right, let's get going. Let's do a quick review. Quick review of what we've been uh, started, started doing this week. We're talking about space curves. Those are vector-valued functions. Those are the same thing um, as mathematical objects. Space curves get their name because the graph of these guys, right, where you plot the points associated with all the outputs, ends up looking like a curve in, uh, in three-dimensional or two-dimensional uh, space here. The important bits are that every vector-valued function, of course, just each of its components is a scalar-valued function. Right? X of t times i, y of t times j, z of t times k. And the reason we start with these is that then doing our typical calculus kind of operations on these guys goes through easily. And what I mean by that is if you want to take a limit of a vector value function, take limits of each of the components. If you want to take a derivative of a vector value function, right, we see that here. What do you do? Just take derivatives of each of the components. But the neat thing is that this has geometrical significance. Right? We know that if I take this derivative, I still get another vector value function, r prime of t. But we can interpret that uh, nicely as being the tangent vector to a curve. So you can see that in this picture. Right? I've got r of t. This is the twist from yesterday. Called that. And then each point on the curve represents one output value of my function. But at each point, we compute the derivative. We get another vector. And if I plot it with its tail at that point, there, you can see that it's the tangent vector to the curve. Need enough. Um, so there's something there. There's substance. Right? Computing these things is easy. Compute the derivative of each component. Right? But it has meaning. And we'll, we'll go further down this um, path today by looking at other derivatives right? and seeing what they can tell us about the right, behavior of the curve. All right. And here's a quick um, example I skipped last time, but it's worth, uh, worth doing quickly here. We'll read the <coughs> problem and then, and then work it out, of course. Parameterize the curve of the intersection of the cylinder, x squared plus y squared is 4, and the plane x minus 2y plus z equals, uh, equals 4. The picture all right, is here. So I really have two surfaces now. Right? The plane we're used to the cylinder might be new technically, but no one's going to have trouble understanding what we mean by that. Certainly, I hope you recognize x squared plus y squared equals 4 is a circle. And what we're saying is in three-dimensional space, that means z can take on any value right, to satisfy that. So we really get a circle at every z level, and the result is this cylinder you see here. Right? Not any more complicated than that. All right, the task at hand says parameterize the curve, and I'm may not have pointed out that just that verb, parameterize. What do I mean by that? I just mean write it in the form r of t equals some function of t, right? where the outputs are the, are the positions along that curve. Right? So parameterize means come up with the formula for, might be another way of, uh, of saying it. But we'll use the word parameterize a lot, um, which really means come up with a function. Right? The inputs are parameters, and the outputs are, um, are plotted along that along that object. Uh, let's hope the projector does not overheat. That is the warning we get. All right, so how do you do this, right, do this problem? So I said parameterize the curve means the output should be of the form right, r of t. Equal 
something here. And then it's particular to the problem at hand. So in this one, this is not going to be too difficult because when I, once I see the cylinder, right, my curve has to be on the cylinder, right, which means a circle of radius 2 here. I know how to parameterize that. Right? Circles are things that we should just be able to do right, instinctively. And so I'll write x is 2 cosine t. Do you remember the 2 is the amplitude? It means the radius is 2. There. Y, of course, is 2 sine t. There. Z, we don't know. Anything I put in for z will stay on the cylinder now. Right? The cylinder just has just the x and y's in its, uh, uh, in its formula. So for z, right, that's where the plane comes in. Right? The plane cuts the cylinder at some angle. I want to make sure I stay on the plane, but that's easier than it may sound. Here's the formula for the plane. This has to be satisfied for all my components. Right? Think of the x component of R of t, the y component of R and t, and the z component of R and t have to satisfy that relation. Well, it's pretty easy. We can solve that for z easily enough. And so z is 4 minus x plus 2y. Y. And so to be on the plane just means that equation is satisfied, and so I literally just plug that in. 4 minus x, x is 2 cosine t, plus 2y, plus 4 sine t. So again, the first two components, x and y, came from being on the cylinder, means x and y are in a circle. And the last component is just whatever z has to be to stay on the plane. And there we are. There's a parameterization of the, right, of the curve. Um, sometimes it's a good idea, if you just want to trace it out once, to put some limits on your parameter. 0 to 2 pi will go once around this guy. Um, the question doesn't specify that, so that's not required here. All right. Any issues doing this kind of thing? It's sort of just an extension of the homework problem you did where you found, you know, where points intersect um, a paraboloid, I think, was on the, on the homework. And it just amounts to right, just checking that your coordinates of your, of your curve, in that case a line, right, satisfy the equation of the surface. Right? Same idea here. All right. Let's dive into today because there's plenty of material uh, to look at. So we want to describe motion of objects. Many of you... Right, have been sitting through physics, right, if not you know, last semester, maybe this semester, um, doing Newtonian mechanics. So this will be very familiar um, to you. If not, right, don't worry too much. We're going to keep it pretty simple. But it's a quick application. Everyone right, getting an engineering degree should be familiar with the idea of uh, position, velocity, acceleration, their relationships, and being able to move back and forth um, between them. Uh, then we're we'll talking about arc length. All right, so a way of measuring distance and length along a curve. It's pretty intuitive what that means. It's not so easy to, to formulate it, as we'll see. Uh, and then hopefully we'll talk about uh, the quantity, the quantity kappa, the curvature of curves. We really want to just, and there we just want a really qualitative understanding of it. Um, we won't go deep into the formulas for that, uh, that concept, but it's a good one, no, curvature. Usual links. Uh, abound. All right, uh, before we dive into motion, we do need to address this idea of smoothness. And we will use this term a lot, but it's a technical term when it comes to um, curves. So, curve we saw is differential, differentiable, if that limit of the difference quotient exists, meaning just if you can take derivatives, then it's differentiable, uh, is the short end of it. But to be smooth in the case of, of curves in multidimensional space as one more condition, and that's that the derivative, which is a tangent, right, which is a vector, that that vector is never the zero vector. That's different from 1D calculus, right? In 1D calculus, you might see a graph that looks like this, and you'd call it perfectly smooth, right? But its derivative is zero at places. And that's fine in 1D calculus. We, we allow that. We still call that uh, a, differentiable, uh, a differentiable curve. We don't do that in multidimensional. We say that, OK, no, the derivative can't ever be identically zero. 
meaning zero in every component at the same time. And the good reason for that is illustrated with the simple uh, um, uh, twist example. Right, let's see why. For one thing, if a curve is smooth, I can define the unit tangent vector, which says that, <coughs> which just means you divide by the magnitude, that's always length one, that guy. So every smooth curve has a well-defined unit tangent vector at every point. Just divide. And it's good to see a non-example. This one, we saw this kind of partially the day. This is the curve r of t equals t squared t cubed. So we bring this one up because t squared and t cubed are very simple functions. They're smooth functions. They're differentiable. They're infinitely differentiable. They're really nice. However, when we put them together like this into a curve, you can see from the picture Right, why we might not want to call that smooth. Right? It's got a cusp in it. And that's because the derivatives both vanish at zero. Right? You both get zero, zero, and t is, is zero. So the picture you get when you draw the tangent vector, oops, now we Anyway, I'll just draw it again quickly on the chalkboard here. All right. This is the curve we see. If you start drawing tangent vectors on here, you realize something bad happens at zero. It suddenly flips and turns around, right around, right, right over here. And so that's why it's not smooth. We don't have a nice continuous um, uh, unit tangent vector. Anyway, one example to keep in mind that's, that's new about multidimensional uh, calculus. You can have smooth components, right? But the overall curve is not smooth. We'll mostly deal with smooth things, right, when we parameterize. I'm worried that that didn't. OK, so we have limits. We have derivatives, right? The logical next step to, to investigate is integrals. I think I mentioned just as we were leaving on Tuesday uh, that these go through just as easily, and they do, for the same reasons, right? Is that the operations we apply to get integrals, right? They're pretty simple. It's just limits, sums, right? And scalar multiples. We'll make, the, don't forget the definition of this definite integral on the left here, right? The definition is not about areas, it's just about a limit of sums, right? This guy, here's the Riemann sum, right? And if you're getting a little intimidated by the notation, you're like, oh, I know I did Riemann sums once upon a time, um, but we stopped using them pretty quickly because of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Don't worry, we're not gonna use this notation all that much, but I think it's healthy to you know, refresh your memory about it. But it's worth noting, the same exact expression right, of Riemann sums for scalar-valued functions works for vector-valued functions, because the only operations we do are scaling and adding. So this is the expression. What are the things we're adding up? A value of our function, that's a vector, right, things, times delta t. Right, so remember, that was the width of your little rectangles in in the, the first example of integrals. Now delta t is just delta t. It's just a small change in the parameter. You multiply it. Now it's scalar multiplication here. But you add it up, you get a vector. Right? If, it's, if it's integrable, that limit exists. End of, end of story. And so the conclusion is just as nice as with limits, right? with limits here. If you want to integrate a vector-valued function, right? integrate each component. Integrate x, integrate y, integrate z. It's just, right, just that easy. <clears throat> the weirder thing about this, though, is to realize what is that thing you get. Right? When you integrate a single variable function, often we think about an area or a assigned area, right? net area. You can add the, right, add the area above the x-axis and subtract the area below the x-axis. Uh, we really got to leave that behind. 
um, as just one example of an integral. Right? Integral is an accumulation. It's a sum of things right here. If we're adding up, we're integrating a vector-valued function, our result is a vector, it's this vector here. Right? We'll, see. we'll see an application of it. But it's not an area per se. Right? It's a vector. So just is what it is. Yeah. Is there a question? Okay, but the good news, fundamental theorem looks exactly the same right. uh, as, we, as we had before. I like this form of it, but you, know, you, can, you can subtract the R of A to the other side if, you, if that looks better um, uh, to you. But what this tells me in this form is that a function, right, vector value function, right, it can be given by one value of the function, so that's what R of A is, plus an integral of the change. I use the variable tau because I need a dummy variable here, right? I left t up there. Right, but that's, a, that's a way I like to, I like to write the fundamental theorem that way. All right. Um, I'm going a little quick, just slow me down, stop, point at, point at things. But we'll get to the applications of these quickly. Uh, quickly enough, right, right now, in fact, that hopefully you'll see this, right, the integrals in, in practice. So here's motion in a, right, in a very short presentation. It's almost just, um, it's almost just uh, uh, terminology, really, right, there's nothing too new here. So if we have a vector valued function that represents position as a function of time, right, it's an easy way to think about what a curve, certainly in like three-dimensional space is, I talked about a bee flying around this room, right? so it's at a different position at each point in time. R of t is the right way to model that. Right. Well. So if we have R of t is position, then its derivative we call velocity. Right. Right. It's change. It, what information does it hold? It says, okay, this is where the bee was headed at a particular time and right, in direction, and the magnitude tells you how fast it was going. Right. It really gives you speed. So speed is a scalar. Right, this is worth thing, right? So it's the magnitude of the of velocity. Velocity is a vector. So it's really important to keep those distinct. Right? They were distinct in 1D motion too, um, but it's just you know absolute value versus right, where velocity could have a sign. Now this is more obviously separates velocity, vector, speed, scalar, and it works out with the first letter too. Um, and then the derivative of velocity is, of course, acceleration, change of velocity, which gives us Newton's second, right, which is used in Newton's second law of motion, right, the one that you want to uh, remember. F equals ma, right? So the force is proportional to the acceleration, right? Uh, constant proportionality is the mass of the object. Old hat, but the worth thing to know that in, in vector language now, right? Just realize that this ma, right, m is a scalar, right, things have mass, they don't have mass in a direction, it just has right, an amount of mass or, or, or not. Um, and then acceleration, though, is a vector, right, it's going to go in that way, right, you apply a force to something, right, the acceleration is going to be in that direction as well. All right, look, that was right, a semester of physics in one slide, right, you don't need Let's do a, a neat, right, a, right, quick example, and this phenomenon will come up a few times uh, in, the, in this course. So, force applied perpendicular to an object's velocity can't change its speed. Right? That's quite a mouthful. Right? We just want to unpack that sentence and then show that it's true using the properties we know of, of, of vectors. Uh, here. All right, so it's about force. I see perpendicular. Right in there, velocity cannot change uh, its speed there. So we want to show that this thing is true. The key, one key word I want you to come out with first, right, the thing that as a calculus student that should jump out at you here, right, cannot change, right, no change. When you hear those words, right, something is not changing, or so, rather something is constant is another way of thinking about it. Immediately your mind should go to, oh, derivative zero, right? The derivative of something is right, it's not changing, Right? 
go to derivatives. In fact, I tell my Calc 1 students, right, if you, if you like, black out at some point and you suddenly become conscious and you realize you're in a calculus test and you don't know how you got there, um, right, it's sort of a nightmare scenario, but it, right, could happen. In that case, what should you do? Differentiate something and set it equal to zero, right? You got a good chance that that's what you're supposed to do. So we'll do that here. So what's not changing? It's speed. So the way I would write that is the derivative, oops, let's get rid of those things. The derivative of speed. So I want to investigate this guy, right, the change in speed. Now there's a trick when you're ever dealing with the magnitude of vectors, right, in, like, in computations. Often it's easier to deal with the square. So I'm actually going to deal with the square of this guy. I want to know if this guy is changing, if the speed square is changing. Notice if the speed is not changing, it's zero, then the square of the speed is not changing either. Equivalent. All right, so I want to investigate this quantity. Right, this is the change in the square of the speed there. But the reason to use speed is that I can write this as the dot product. Right, R prime of t dotted R prime of t. So far, so good. And then I promised you last time that I would use the product rule at some point. Here it is. Right. So the product rule for dot products it looks like the product rule for derivatives in general. Differentiate the first one and the second one. So it's going to be r prime prime of t dot r prime of t plus, of course the opposite, r prime of t dot R prime prime of t. And so what's that? That's 2 R prime prime of t dotted with R prime of t. Again, stop me if one of these steps doesn't make sense. You don't have to memorize these by any means, but you should be able to follow along and, and see that they're, uh, they're true. And now look what I have. I've got the dot product between the acceleration and the velocity. My assumption was that the acceleration and the velocity, or rather the force and the velocity were perpendicular. <coughs> this equals two A dot V. Right. That's two times the acceleration, which is, of course, if we want to be really plain about it, two over the mass times the force dotted with the V. There. And so then remember what the statement says. It says, if the force is perpendicular to the velocity, you can't change its speed. Well, here's the force, here's the velocity. If they're perpendicular, we get zero. And so if we get zero there, that means the speed's not changing. This is a good little derivation Right, to have seen it comes up in a bunch of different contexts, not just acceleration and velocity, but <coughs> if a vector's magnitude is fixed, right, that's another way of saying this, right? This, right if the, um, uh, well, let's see, it's the converse of this. If the magnitude of a vector is fixed, its derivative right, has to be orthogonal to it. seeing that um, here. And for, for the same reason. Right? When you differentiate the dot product, right, you get a dot product of the derivative with itself. Um, right, so this comes up in context. One, you may have encountered magnetism. Right? This happens all the time. There's the law of magnetism. Um, we'll look at magnetic fields at, at some point. But if you have a magnetic field and you've got a charged particle moving in it, right, you get a force. Right? But that force, it turns out, comes from a cross product, right? Magnetic field cross the velocity, right here, times the, right, times the charge, gives you the force. So that means the force is always orthogonal to the velocity. Magnetic fields can't speed things up. 
They just change direction. Yeah? Um, could you explain why you pick the magnitude squared? Uh, because it's easier to work with is, this, is the short answer, right? And this and otherwise differentiating it, you have to have that, you have a denominator thing from the radical and it's just, it, were, it still goes through, it's just not as clean. Good. Okay, so that's a neat, right, one neat application. So anytime right, something's moving, if you push on it and you push on it orthogonal to where it's moving, you're not going to speed it up or slow it down. I think it makes some intuitive sense. Same derivation, just Okay, let's do another example I like this one. It's a very straightforward mechanics example. Like here's an acceleration, find a position. However, I like these kinds where the acceleration is given by some kind of piecewise function. It really you have to think about how to assemble uh, the answer here. Right? So there's, of course, one of these on the homework that you'll have to um, deal with. It. So just deal with it in pieces and then think about how these things glued together. So I got a particle. It starts at rest at the origin. That's a nice way to start. Right? Starting position is 0, 0. Starting velocity is 0, 0 um, here. And it's subject to this acceleration. Right? So it's got i minus t, j. Or, right? So it's moving to the right and increasingly getting pushed down. Right? t, j is getting, t is getting bigger there. And then at some point, after six seconds, there's no acceleration. This is not a ridiculous thing to model. You can imagine, right, hitting the accelerator on a car, right, and then suddenly you pull your, right, you pull your foot off. Right, you do this right, fairly frequently. So it's like suddenly turning off the acceleration. Right, there, right, maybe kind of discontinuously. Uh, the question is what happens, right? Of course, you pull your foot off the accelerator of a car, it doesn't stop instantly, or right, if it does, you've got a problem with your car. You probably have the emergency brake on. So we wanted to decide what, how, to, right, how to work this. Okay, so what's the procedure? There are a couple ways to organize this. The way I do it is not the only way uh, um, to do it, but it is the way I do it. All right. Come on. All right, so what are we going to do? First thing we're going to do is go from acceleration to velocity, so we're just going to integrate here. But I'm going to do this in pieces. Since the acceleration is defined in pieces, I'm going to do the velocity right, defined in pieces. So 4 t less than or equal to 6 here. I know that v of t equals v of 0 plus the integral from 0 to t of i minus t j d. I'm going to use a tau here. I need a dummy variable. Fundamental theorem of calculus, nothing more than that. Take an antiderivative right, to find, to go from acceleration to velocity, like an antiderivative. I write them this way with the initial condition here to make sure I have that constant of integration right, right, right away. Right. There are other ways to figure that out as well. Okay. All right, so what do we do? Well, velocity at zero is zero, so that's simple, right? This is an easy vector to integrate. I'm going to get ti minus t squared over 2j. That's easy. There's the velocity for at least for the first six seconds. There. And then I'll write r of t for position. You'll also see x of t here sometimes for position. That's fine. Starting position plus the integral from 0 to t of the velocity. So that's now tau i minus tau squared over 2 j d tau. Uh, no, I've got, I've got enough room to do that here. Initial position is, uh, is here. It's zero. I take an antiderivative. It's just as um, easy. I end up with t squared 
over 2i minus t cubed over 6j. All right, so this part with t less than 6, simple. Right. To do, just take antiderivatives. The initial conditions were easy, it was just zero. Everything went, went through, fine. All right, now I want to see what happens after 6, right? The acceleration changes there. And so what I can do, though, is just realize, all right, I know what happens for the first six seconds. In particular, I can figure out what happens exactly at six right, by just plugging in six for t here. And then I get a new problem. So I'll write that out here. Right. R of six. Equals, of course, I have to look back for a second to check it out. All right, what is it? 18. Um, 18 minus 36J. 36 J here. V of 6. Again, just plug in here. 6I minus 18J. Uh, And so now I've got a new problem. Right. It's just a new initial value problem right. where I'm trying to figure out what happens after 6. My acceleration, however, is 0. Right. That means my velocity is constant after right. t equals 6. So for t greater than or equal to 6, v of t equals v of six, all right, equals v of six. Six i minus 18j, all right. Acceleration is zero, it stops changing. Constant now. And then uh, my position function becomes very easy to do. I'll write this out a little carefully. So what's position now? Well, it's gonna be the position at six plus the integral from 6 to t right, of this constant velocity, 6i minus 18j d tau. All right. <clears throat> so what do we up with that's 18 plus 6 d minus 6 i and then for the <coughs> j component uh, minus 36 Minus 18, t minus 6, j. All right, nothing very exciting about these particular numbers, but I'll draw you the picture in a second, which does make, makes a good bit of, of sense. But the moral of the story, when you have an acceleration that's piecewise defined, just an, answer the question in pieces. Right? For the first piece, you know, just, you know, use the part where you'll have a nice uh, formula for the acceleration. Right? Find the conditions, position, velocity at the right at the transition point, and then make a new problem. There, going forward. I think this is right. All right. Any calculation parts that you're mixed up on, let me know. But then I'd certainly want you to be able to translate this into a, right, or appreciate the picture that comes along with this. So, what up? Which is here. So we end up with, of course, a piecewise defined uh, curve here. This is the position curve, right? And so we have this t squared t cubed behavior until six seconds. And then what I've graphed here is what would happen if we kept that acceleration all the time, i minus tj. That's the dashed line 
over here. Right, that's, where, that's where it would have continued on that trajectory. But what happens at six, of course, the acceleration goes to zero. That means we just keep that tangent vector, that velocity vector the whole time, and that's a straight line. So it lines up nicely. So, right? You've seen this phenomenon if you've ever like swung something over your head and then you let go. Right? What happens to it? It continues traveling right, in the direction of the tangent vector. Where it was, where it was going. All right. You'll practice with these a little bit on the right, on the homework. Uh, it right, boils down to just some good bookkeeping, right? The skill of taking antiderivatives, I think most of you have, um, and can certainly get back up to speed quickly. Right. I'm not going to ask you to integrate anything too right, too difficult there, but matching up the constants, making sure things work out. It's a bit of a challenge. All right. How are we doing? <coughs> Pretty well. Let's talk about arc length. I'm not going to belabor motion any more, than, right, any more than that. So you have an intuition about what arc length is. Right? If you have a curve in the plane or in space, right, we think of it as a path. Right? Like, and it's a natural question to ask me, OK, how long is the path? You've done this if you ever uh, you look up directions on, um, on Google Maps or something, right? And they draw some, right, if you're going by roads, it draws some path on the streets, right, between where you are and the destination, and then it computes how long your path is. It doesn't measure as a crow flies, right? It literally right, adds up all the distances of your, uh, of your path. So we want to, right, we want to do that <coughs> um, for curves, right? And let's derive how to, right, how to do that. Here's a picture of how we're going to do that. So I've got a curve in space here. It's like cosine. Looks like cosine 3t. Uh, looks like cosine sine, cosine 3t, or something like, like that. The formula doesn't matter for this discussion here. So there's my, right, there's my curve. The question is, OK, well, what do I mean by arc length? Intuitively, I know what I mean. Right. One way of thinking about it is if that path were traced out with a string, right, that couldn't stretch, right, then I just took that string and strained it out, right, and I just measure it with a ruler. That should give me arc length. Right? That's the intuition of what, right, what I should do. Now, I can't actually, that process of taking a string and pulling it is not something I can do easily mathematically, although it can be done. So instead, what we're going to do is use our tools of vectors right, to do this. We know how to compute vectors. We know how to compute lengths of vectors. And so if I just pick a couple of points on my curve, right, so that means like sampling, we call it sampling my curve, and I connect them with vectors or right, line segments there, I can just measure easily enough the length of each line segment, right, add them up, I get a number, then, okay, that's approximately how long my curve is. Now, if I pick six points, I get this guy, a little hexagon there. That's not going to be a very good estimate for the arc length of this guy. We appreciate it. But what do we do in calculus all the time? We find estimates in a discrete case, and we find that they can, we can get them better by increasing right, a parameter, and then we can take limits. Right? That's the magic of calculus. So then we can do this process. So visually, what are we doing? There's 16 points around my curve. Right? So now I just sample 16 points around my curve, add up the length between consecutive ones, or distance between consecutive ones. Right. You can see that's a better estimate of my arc length. And of course, it gets better and better as the number of sample points increases. At some point, it becomes indistinguishable from the curve. Right. And so now, that really is 81 different line segments around my curve there. And if I add up the lengths of all those little line segments, I think it's a pretty good right, approximation. For the, for the actual arc length. And indeed, if I take a limit, right, right, and that limit converges, we're going to call that arc length. Right? Arc length is, uh, is the limit of that sum. Right here. Once you hear limit of a sum, you know it's going to be an integral of something. Uh, by the way, the funny thing about this is right, how is the, the curve itself is graphed in this picture. Right? The computer graphs the curve, and then it graphs the little segments going around. But the curve itself is really just a bunch of segments itself. Right? I can't. Discrete number of pixels 
it's a finite state machine, right? It doesn't actually have a continuous curve in its memory. It has like, a bunch of sample points itself, right? And then your brain does the work of making it smooth, right, together. Right? The computer doesn't make it smooth, your brain does that, which I always think is cool. All right. All right, um, maybe you don't even need to like, write this piece of the derivation down. I wouldn't, I don't think. It's going to be on the slides, right? Don't, right? don't worry about it. Just make sure that the expressions make sense, right? And then we'll arrive at a formula. You can write down the final formula. Right? It's not, no need to really duplicate all this work. All right, so the reasonable approximation, this is just the formulaic version of the picture you just saw. I'm going to take N, capital N, different points along my curve, so that, <laughs> where does that come from? My curve is parameterized. I should point this out. Right. Now we've got R of T for T in A, B. Right. So A and B are numbers. A and B is an interval. T goes from A to B. And then R of T traces out my curve there. And then I can make the definition here. Delta T is just B minus A over N. I chop that interval up into N pieces, right? Capital N. So that's where this notation comes from. Right. So what am I going to do? I'm going to add up a bunch of distances of my curve. Right. R at A plus I delta T. So I is an index going up to N. Counts up, one, two, three, four, up to n. And so I start at a, I move in segments of delta t down my curve, evaluate my function, that's a vector, minus the neighboring vector, right? A, you see a plus i minus one, right? just one. So that's just the distance between neighboring points and my sample points. Again, I'm using vectors, difference, absolute value, that's distance. And then I do a trick. Right? This is a trick that's you know, used over and over again to how do I get integrals out of my um, computations here. So delta t is not zero. Right? <coughs> Excuse me. So I can divide, I can, I can multiply and divide by it. Right? So all of the expression, the only difference from here to here is I multiply and divide by delta t. And that's, that's it. So that's algebraically exactly the same. But then what happens? I'm going to take my number of points to go to infinity. That means delta t goes to zero. Right? That's the same, same thing. Delta t is b minus a over n. Delta t goes to zero. So I take a limit here. And here's all of calculus in one, right, one fell swoop. My uh, instructor for multivariable right, described calculus as just translating from Greek into German. That's all you have to do. Right. We've got. The Greek S here is a sigma. Don't call it an E. Right. It's a sigma. It becomes a German S. That's where the right, old German script, that's where that uh, symbol comes from for the integral sign. Right. Just the S from going to Leibniz. Responsible. The deltas, right, which are discrete distances, discrete changes in my, um, in my uh, computation, become Ds. Right. So this guy up here becomes drdt. That's the long story, somewhat shorter. How do you find the arc length of a curve? Integrate the magnitude of the tangent vector. The whole time. All right. So be careful. This thing is a scalar. Right? Take the derivative, right? then take its magnitude, and then integrate it. That's where we get if R is position, this means integrate the speed, right? Gets you distance. That makes sense. Okay, so certainly know this part, right? Here's a curve, how long is it? Do that. But do note these integrals tend to be difficult to do by hand, right? Because I've got the magnitude, uh, magnitude of a vector, you've got that square root sitting in there, right? So if you just write down a random curve and try and figure out how long it is, you often get integrals that are hard to do. You get elliptic integrals, you get all sorts of 
difficult ones uh, to do. Right? So you don't have to do too many. But the formula should um, uh, make sense. However you want to talk. Can we do one of these? We'll do this quickly enough. So a helix, that's one example where we can figure out its, right? We can figure out its um, uh, uh, length easily enough. So one coil. One coil means zero is less than t is less than two pi, right? So I need to know the range on this to get a finite answer. So I'll call this thing R of t. R prime of t, I can compute easily enough. Minus sine t cos t one. And then I need the magnitude of R of t. But this is where things get nice. That's going to be the square root sine squared t plus cosine squared t plus 1. Which is root 2. So this is, of course, why when this example is given, it has a very nice derivative, or rather the uh, length of the derivative is easy, it's root two, and so the arc length zero, two pi, root two dt is trivial, two root two. It's a very simple example because the, this works out so nicely um, there. But there's a reason I like this example as well, is that you can answer this question without doing any calculus also, if you like. Remember, this is one, right, um, one round of a helix here. All right, so let's try that again. Right. So a helix, we can say, sticks to a cylinder. There's my curve of the helix once around. We can think of it as on a, on a cylinder of radius one, right? Cosine sine stick to a circle of radius one, and then you can do something fancy. Do some surgery here. Cut this. Imagine cutting this cylinder and opening it up. Right. Into a sheet. That's not the scale, right over here. But like a poster board, you open it up this way. What happens to your curve here when you fold it out? You end up just getting the diagonal of this rectangle. That's supposed to be a straight line. But you just get a diagonal of this rectangle. And how big is this rectangle? Right. Um, over here. Oh, this isn't bad. Well, the height here is 2 pi, because t goes from 0 to 2 pi. And then notice the distance around on top here. Right? That's the circumference of a circle of radius 1. That's 2 pi. So if you unfold this thing, you just get a square. Right. And the diagonal of a square is easy enough. Just do good old Pythagorean theorem. Right. What's the other side? Well, it's 2 pi root 2. Right. 2 pi squared plus 2 pi squared. Take the square root. So you didn't need any calculus to do this. But at least it lines up with our answer, things work out. All right, I'm just gonna keep, keep going here. That was not the most exciting stuff in the world. All right, reparameterization. I always debate how much to go in on this because it's, uh, Gets a, people get a little confused um, pretty easily. I get confused pretty easily in this process. Uh, so let's try and concentrate on the what is happening here and the, and the particulars we'll, we'll, we won't get too bogged down in. What does reparameterization mean? So what you will need to do here is separate 
the concept of a curve in space or a path in space as simply being a set of points traced out. Right? So when you look at the graph of one of these guys, you're really looking at just a path. Right? Right? So it's just a particular set of points in space. And when you look at that graph, you can't see how it's traced out, per se. Right? You don't know at t equals 0, I'm here, and then at t equals 1, I'm here, and so on. Right? So, so that information right, that includes where you are at a particular time is the parameterization of your curve. Right? So we think of the curve or the path as a set of points in space. And the parameterization is the R of t that tells you, OK, at t, I'm at t equals 0, you're here. At t equals a half, you're here, et cetera. So those are different. So because those are separate concepts with the same curve, you can have multiple parameterizations. Right? We saw this with lines. Right? To parameter, write the parametric form of a line, you can pick any point on it, and you can pick any multiple of the direction vector, right? any scalar multiple of the direction vector, and they works. So there are lots of choices for parameterizing lines. That's true of curves in general. So the same curve can be traced out lots of different ways. We, right, the circle was kind of the first example we saw of a curve right here. Right? If you just take plain old cosine t, sine t, right, you trace it out over the interval from 0 to 2 pi. In fact, that's, using, that's moving at unit speed. Right? It goes a distance 2 pi for every input of 2 pi there. The same curve, of course, we is achieved if we change the uh, frequency. Right? So 16 pi here. Right. And 16 pi, that's a much higher frequency. It's the same path, but traversed much faster. Right. And what I mean by faster is the t only needs to go from 0 to an eighth. Right. Over here. Right. So it's the same curve, parameterized differently. So the change between these two is called a reparameterization. Right. And there are lots of reasons you might want to reparameterize. Um, a curve. Right? We'll see a, a really important one in a second. Right? But conceptually, it's not so bad. Right? It just means same curve, same set of output points, different um, um, different input values tracing them out. All right. So there's a particular important reparameterization you can do. Right? So for any smooth curve, you can do this. And this is, again, why we emphasized smooth before. Right? The derivative isn't 0. The derivative is not 0. <coughs> we can parameterize by arc length um, here. And so before we get into the formulas, think about what that means is. It means the parameter that you stick in is a scalar, that that scalar can be interpreted as arc length. So as you, your parameter goes from 0 to 1, your curve traces out a distance one. Right? It goes up to three halves, it traces out another distance of a half. Right? So, so this is valuable. Think of these as like mile markers on a road. Right? You've got a different parameterization of the New Jersey Turnpike. Right? You've got the exit numbers, right? which are strangely important to some people. Um, right, what exit? Yeah, but they only go up to like 16 or something, right? at the George Washington Bridge down to uh, down to one of the Delaware Memorial Bridge. Oh, and so that you can think of that as a parameterization of the New Jersey Turnpike. But it's certainly not relevant to arc length right there, right? It's a long trip to, to Philly uh, down the Jersey Turnpike. So you can, there are also mile markers on the road. And so those are a parameterization by arc length, right? You look at the side, and it tells you you're at mile 137, mile 138. I don't know. If, is, it, is it over 100 miles? I don't know. But hopefully the, the idea makes sense, right? Then you can certainly have the input being the arc length, it, uh, arc length itself. And so how do we do this? Well, if you take any parameterization right, of a curve, that's what's happening here, we can certainly make a function that gives me arc length as a function of t. So that's just the arc length formula. I'm just realizing here that the, what I'm measuring is a parameter itself, t. And so I get a function of t right out of here. s is going to be the arc length parameter is a function of t. It's a scalar valued function. t goes in, a distance comes out. Right. Thing. So this is an important expression. Right. Up here. All right, some things to note. 
S of B, right, that's the end point of my curve, that gives me the whole length of the whole thing. Fundamental theorem of calculus right, tells us something. ds dt is the speed. But of course it is, right? Think of s as distance, right? So distance per time gives you speed. There's nothing, nothing weird about that. But you should also see it from this expression, right? If you differentiate up here, the integrand just pops out. All right. That's good. But the next line is the is the key here. Right? So s of t, this function, right, it's a function of time, it's always increasing because right? our curve is smooth. Right? That means this scalar in here is never zero, so it's always positive. There. So s is the integral of a positive function. Those are always increasing. Okay, so no matter what curve you put in there, as long as it's a smooth curve, as you trace it out, you're increasing the distance. So this function is invertible. All right, that's if you're following your theory. Invertible, remember, invertible functions, you can flip them over the y-axis, or right, there's one way to think of it. But you can, in other, essentially, you can solve for t. In them. It's the real way to think about what an invertible function is. Right? It's not, it's one-to-one, -one, it's on. So it's invertible. So what that means is I can plug in its inverse in back into r. And I'll get r as a function of s. is the idea. And so then I'll have a reparameterization of my curve. R will put the same outputs. Um, uh, R will have the same outputs, but it'll be traced out with a parameter s, starts at zero, right, at, R, at the beginning, moves up to L, the length of the curve. So this process is uh, okay, important. In particular, as we'll see in a second, it lets you compare two different curves, right? So someone presents you with a path, r of t. Someone else presents you with another path, q of t, right? So these two paths. You can think of it as maybe, right, Google gives you multiple options for how you want to go, right? You want to go up to Cornell. I don't know why, but right? some people do that. Um, here, right, you can take 17, or you can go out to 81 and then go up or something like that. That, right? You have multiple paths here, and you want to compare them. Right? Well, one way is like, which one's faster is often. Uh, right? But as we'll see, there are other ways to compare them. But if you just have two parameterizations, right, two different people drive there, right, you might not be able to compare the paths because someone drives faster than someone else. There. But if you parameterize their paths by arc length, right, then you can compare them right, directly on some kind of even footing. So this is <coughs> good old chain rule applies. There's nothing weird about this. The chain rule applies in multivariable calculus just as easily as it does in single variable calculus, especially in this context, because everything, right, for vector value functions, this expression on the left, it's just the derivative of each component right, in there. So our prime of t is just by the chain rule, this thing is scalar multiplication here right, between these two expressions. Derivative dr with respect to s, so that's the derivative of r with respect to the arc length parameter, right, times ds dt, just how the chain rule works. The, the notation is very suggestive. And this is how we get the tangent vector. So what this means here is what does it mean to parameterize by arc length? So lock this away. It was a, this was a um, multiple choice problem that, that fewer people than I expected got right, which is to say when a path is parameterized by arc length, what's its derivative? That was the only question. The answer is the derivative is the unit tangent vector. If a curve is parameterized by arc length, that means it's changing exactly distance one for every one input. So the length of the tangent vector is always one. There, right? 
So it's tracing it at unit speed. All right, so I want to compare two paths. All right, if I parameterize them by arc length, it's the same as saying, okay, walk along this path exactly at one meter per second or something like that. And then you can say, okay, then the, the derivative will have length one. All right, that's a lot of, I mean, that's a lot of technical, like, derivations there. This is the right, piece that <laughs> that makes sense. A curve parameterized by arc length, right, always speed one. In other words, its derivative is the unit tangent vector. That's good because then we can compare curves. Do I want to do this example? Do I have time? I can. Let's try it. Just to see the process once. This is cooked up to actually work, like the derivative to work out. But let's watch the process happen All right, uh, at once. Hopefully this, that we can, this will um, work out. So parameterized by arc length, what do you do? Again, first thing to do, let's get arc length as a function of t. So that's easy. We're going to start at t equals 0, so we get 0 to t. And then I'm going to need the length of the derivative of this guy. We'll call this r of t. So I want the length of r prime. And since I'm using t over here, of course, i got to use some other variable here. That's why tau keeps coming up. Right, that's the Greek t. I just need a dummy variable, anything other than t. So what is that? Well, let's calculate it over here. r prime t. I haven't done this in a few minutes. Minus e to the minus t. All right, 2. I think that's, that, that should be an exponent. I think it's a misprint. 2 e to the minus t minus 2 e to the minus t. Oh, yeah, this is no problem. Oh, this problem's not as complicated as I, as I thought. All right, there's the derivative. Let's take its length. To notice when you're taking lengths of, of vectors, if they're all scaled by the same number, right, e, to, e to the minus t here, we can pull it out. that and I think that works out nicely right that's just three yeah so this one will cook out to be fairly easy so this had a nice right has a nice derivative let's keep going zero to t three e to the minus tau equals, that's 3 minus um, e to the minus tau. Right? Right. Good. All right, so there's, there's s of t. So I've got arc length as a function of time. If I want to get time as a function of arc length, which is what I want to do to reparameterize, so this is the always tricky part, I just want to solve this for t. Right? It's always doable. There's always an answer. It's not always easy, right, algebraically, to do this. Right? When you pick curves, you get weird expressions here that are sometimes awfully hard. This one's easy enough, but they're not always easy, so we have e to the minus t equals 3 minus s what's t there's a log in here uh, t is minus log 3 minus s
right? Any problems? I'm, I, I, it's always possible I messed it up, but yeah. Oh, three, three minus three to the t, right? It should be here. Yeah. yeah. So you and you factored it out. Yeah, you're right. One minus that. All right. Sorry. Yeah, that makes more. That makes more sense. All right. All right so what do we have? That's one minus s over three. Yeah. Story so we can plug that back into <coughs> we can plug that back into our equation using minus s three over s. I don't like that. Uh, I don't know, one minus s. All right. Plug this guy back into the original equation. So R of S equals, so E to the minus and the minuses cancel, so I'm just going to get 1 minus S over 3, 1 minus 2 S over 3, 2 S over 3, did I forget the 1 minus? Yeah, one my oops. Mm -hmm. D is log, so one minus minus two times one minus s over three. There we go. Two. One minus s over three. That's better. And what do we come up with? Well, this thing's a line. What it boils down to. So the thing's a line. It starts at one one zero. Uh, no, sorry, uh, I, that's not true. Right. But anyway, this is a linear equation. This guy moves at unit speed. Right. If you look at the speed of this guy, it's right. It's got minus a third, uh, two thirds, minus two thirds. We take the length of that guy. It's one. All right. So what's the point of doing right, all of this? Right? Why do I want this parameterization here? Well, one way is, as I mentioned, you want to compare two roots and you want to see how far you are at any given point. It makes sense to have them parameterized in some kind of uniform way. Right? So speed one is one the way that makes a lot of sense. The last use of this right, is to understand curvature right, of paths. And first thing I want to do is convince you that you understand this already, right? The idea of curvature, it's a measure of how curvy a path is, right? Just leave it at that for a time being. And I'll convince you that you all know how to do this already. I've got three paths labeled here. Forcing my colorblindness doesn't tell me which is which. But there are three paths, right, in three different colors. They all go through the origin. Curve one, curve two, and curve three. Right, so there they are. So concentrate at the origin. Right. We want to tell you which one of these paths is curviest, or, or rank them from curviest to least curvy right, um, of them. So right, we're observing here. It's worth noting, of course, curvature of a path can change. Right? You can have a path that goes really, really curvy and then straightens out. Right? So, when we talk about curvature of a path, we're going to talk about at every point we can measure the curvature. Yeah. So at the origin here, where all three of these, uh, I think all three of these go. No, not quite. All right. So they don't all pass to the origin. All right. In any case, rank them for me from curviest to least curvy. Someone do it. Right. Two, three, one. All right. What's next? Right. Makes sense to me. That's exactly right. the curve. Is anyone not, would anyone do a different ranking for curves? I didn't, un unlikely. Exactly, right? So that's what we want to measure. Right? Which one of these things is curvy? Right? I know it when I see it, 
there. Right? Curve one, right? straight line. Right? That's the least curvy thing possible. And indeed, it has curvature zero. Right? So curvature is a scalar measurement. It's for curves, it's always non-negative. So, so things are positive or zero curvature. Zero curvature means straight line. And then the higher the number, the curvier it is. And so we want to think, how can we make that more than quotes? Right? How can we take our intuition about how curvy something is and translate it to a quantity that we can actually measure? And the secret to doing this is parameterization by arc length. So I want to think, of, I think about two roads right, that you can drive down. Right? Certainly, right, one's a straight shot. Right. Uh, somewhere you would not curvy, right? Doesn't you don't have to turn the steering wheel, not curvy at all. Other roads around a mountain, right, around some curve, certainly you want to measure which one's curvier. It would be affected by certainly how fast you drove down there. Right? Drive really fast and slam the wheel around, you really feel it going. Right? Um, whereas any curve, you go slow enough, you don't right, you don't feel any uh, any effect. So certainly, if we're going to compare roads, we want to regulate that. Right? We don't want the speed to come into it. So you parameterize by arc length. Right? Then two roads that you have to traverse at the same speed, you can compare their curvature by simply asking how fast does the direction change. It certainly makes sense. right? So if I'm facing forward and I'm moving along the curve, if I'm going at the same speed on two different roads, if my view is changing faster on one than the other, then it's certainly curvier. And so this is the expression. I want you to just understand this expression. We're not even going to use it to compute that often. I just want you to understand what this measures. Right? You can compute it. There are other formulas for computing it. They're in your textbook. They're cool. You do not have to memorize any of them here. But you should look at this formula, and it should make sense that this kappa is a scalar. Right? It's non-negative because it's the length of a vector uh, here and that it corresponds with a curvier path. So there's a bit going on here. Right? You start with a curve, r of t. You then form the unit tangent vector. Right? And where do you get that? You get that by parameterizing by arc length. So you parameterize by arc length. And then what happens? The derivative of that guy is the unit tangent vector. So then you take its derivative so that's the change of the unit tangent vector. So the unit tangent vector is changing, or, or maybe it's not, maybe it's constant. But if it's changing, you measure how much it's changing this way. So this is like acceleration, but it's not on the nose acceleration. Right? It's acceleration when you parameterize by arc length, is what that guy is. So right, when is that thing big? It's when t changes direction really fast. So even for a little bit of distance, t changes quite a lot. When you're in a straight line, t never changes. Right? The tangent vector is always the same. It doesn't change. You're going to get curvature zero. Out of that. Uh, that. And then in, in between, right? If you're changing gradually, right, you're going to get a small magnitude vector out of the TDS. So here's another way of seeing the exact same thing. Again, just the chain rule might help a little bit right here. I don't think this is all that much helpful. This is the part I think you should lock away in your brain, right, is, um, uh, is this guy up here, right? This one, a little more convenient for actually computing it, but we're not going to be doing that so often in this class. It's that guy. So there's an um, example on your homework to do this where I take a family of curves and you're saying as this parameter changes you get these different curves and I want you to imagine what's happening to the curvature and so you just think you don't have to compute this number you just have to think about well what would happen which one of these has a tangent vector that's changing faster right the unit tangent vector all right I'm sorry with a lot of talking today but that's the Have a good weekend.